I've got some ambient lighting. I feel like it's really dark where I am and you guys are really well lit. Oh, I don't know about that. We, we could probably use a little more lighting. Pat's always, <laughs> Pat's always like bright side, dark side, which is really weird because it's always so happy. I like it. Well, you know, Pat, I like that I can see like your, your wardrobe behind you. Like I can oh, see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's all that's all my wife's extra clothes. Uh, it's the only room. Um, I mean, this is like our our spare bedroom that just be, is just basically a giant closet. <laughs> As a woman in New York City, well, not right now, but in general, I feel the pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's out in Long Island, so he's got a whole house in all. Okay. Floors, no. He's got a lot of rooms. Yeah, there's there's actually two that's closets all. in here, completely full. There's this thing, but we we don't have a closet in our master bedroom yet. So that that's that's why everything is shoved in here. Well, you know what? At least you have multiple rooms to choose as your closet. <laughs> that's fair. That that's what fair. I'm talking about. That is very fair. If I, I start have... pointing the camera around here, you're gonna see a lot of baby stuff because I'm <laughs> my time here is limited. It's like turning into a nursery by the delivery. <laughs> and I don't mean that literally, like, I mean, literally every delivery that shows up is another baby thing in advance. So <laughs> it's like, I'm going to be surrounded by Pampers soon. Um, because hey, you, you know what? To each their own, you know. Yep. I mean, Never it's not it. like, listen, I guess I did choose this, but I didn't realize I was going to be surrounded by, like, this amount of baby stuff this quickly. So I'm... Uh, <laughs> Like, that's what happens dude there's a run on did you know this there's a run on uh on on baby stuff like uh uh formula and um formula and literally um uh, diapers i mean that's that that makes complete sense it's super hard to find wow. yeah like we're not due until end of uh end of july and i'm already i'm already like stocking up because well be careful what size you buy no you i know, know how i know it's gonna be i know <laughs> i know i know i know i know i'm i'm uh i'm buying i've i've already searched the, like diaper calculator and other terms <laughs> 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 that i'm like how many diapers do you need and for how long like yeah yeah, yeah. i'm you doing want to leverage talk Walker to pull some insights yeah we should pull we should up, we are absolutely audience? Absolutely. We should, we should absolutely look and see how people are searching for baby stuff or talking about baby stuff. But what, yeah. whatever your calculator says. We can give you says, some helpful tips and tricks. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's amazing though. I didn't realize how many, how, how few credible sources were actually answering that question, which was actually kind of interesting. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, whatever, whatever your calculator says, Stefan, double it. <laughs> yeah, dude, trust me. I'm, 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 I'm over, I'm, I'm, I don't know. You have to figure like 10 a day. Anyway, no one on this call really no, wants no, to hear how many, how many matter. diapers we're going to roll through at the Bajayo house as soon as yeah. this baby shows up. But, uh, Just you go. so you guys all joined today for uh baby, this is what we're talking about. For baby chat, right? <laughs> Baby chat, where people talk about baby stuff that you don't care about. <laughs> so, uh, you know what? Let's, uh, let's kick this off. People will join as they do, as usual. So, uh, hey guys, thanks so much for joining us for another great episode of Search From Home. Uh, I'm Stefan Bajayo, uh, your host with my co-host, who is actually this way today. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. Oh, look that's at that's that. like, oh high five me. High five me. Oh, wait, you, you're forgetting about me. I'm in the on, middle actually on. of you two right, right now. <laughs> right now, you're here. You're I'm in the middle too? of you both right now. You're, yeah, you're oh, did we both on. smack you in the head? In your yeah, image? you did. Oh, I'm you're so sorry. Me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I actually thought you guys were trying to high five me. Yeah. Well, we will high five you right now. Intro. In your in your intro, we will high five you right now. Kara uh, okay. Buscaglia, <laughs> hopefully I did not completely demolish your name did i it was close <laughs> what did i get wrong well it's biscalia the g biscalia. is silent biscalia. Really, coming really from a guy with a last people. name Bishayo, trust me like last names are not exactly like so i'm very in tune with the idea of people wanting buscaglia Bus <laughs> biscalia buscalia buscalia yes I got it. Sure. there you go uh from talkwalker <laughs> so talkwalker uh so that everyone knows is a partner of ours uh, we promise not to be salesy. We're not trying to be salesy at all on these things. Uh, we just realized uh, when looking at search data in this COVID-19 world where search volume is a lagging indicator that we had a partner who's got more real-time data and they're integrated in our system. So we thought, why not bring 
head of their product here uh, to come chat with us and tell us how we can use social listening data um, to be more effective in our marketing. So, Kara, if you want to give a little background on yourself, I know you're a New Yorker, but you're not in New York right now. So give us a little bit of background and yeah. we'll get into it. Yeah, I, I fled the city. I abandoned my city. I feel very, very, a lot of stress about that. I'm missing the camaraderie of the city, but I fled to Northern California. My name is Kara Biscata and I lead the global solutions team at TalkBook. Or, and what my team does is they really are the industry consultants for internally and then also our customers and our prospects as well. So we do a lot of the research, we develop a lot of the frameworks that lever can be leveraged, especially during these time of crisis and how you can really understand that voice of the customer and really leverage data to move away from a gut intuition to more data-driven insights, which I, I will sound cliche when I say that, but we're all thinking it. Um, actually been at the company for over three and a half years uh, and uh, started in, and launched the solutions team. But before that, was doing PR, market research, and consulting for the Fortune 500 and was actually a top booker client. So, uh, they really convinced me and sold me to the other side. So I was practicing what I was preaching and, you know, really believed in it from that side. So why not, you know, take some of those antiquated practices of combining data sets um, and kind of have an impact on a product with a team that can really look at the, the full 360 degree landscape. So I'm so excited to be here today and talk to you guys, um, you know, about all the information that we have surrounding this pandemic and how it can really be leveraged to inform and shape strategies holistically. Great. It's funny. Uh, Pat used to be a client. Now he's the president. No. <laughs> now he's the vice president. It's true though, dude. He was a client for like, how many years were your client? Five years. Yeah. I was a customer for five years. And then yeah. I've been in June, I believe. Yeah. Just if we're just about there. I will be a conductor for five years. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I've oh, you're 50, 50 now. Yeah. I mean, I'm totally, I'll, I'll, I'll cross over into, into mostly conductor in the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you get, you get it, you know, they sell you on this other side and you really believe in the product and then you come over and you're like, well, I can, we, we can do some great things together. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's a, it's a, I love hearing stories like that though, because that really shows you that like, I love customers who, who like transition to actually working for the company because it, it shows exactly what you said. They really, they care about the product. They care about the industry. They know they can, they can come over make it better. I hope I've had a, you know, a positive impact on conductor. I <laughs> Uh, but I always love hearing stories like that because it's because uh, a lot of times when people ask me, they're like, oh, man, like you were a customer conductor. Then you want to go work for them. I was like, yes. I was like, I'm, I met Seth. God, I met Seth like 11, 12 years ago. I mean, when I was still working at Prime Visibility, uh, yeah. you know, which is now part of W Promote, which I which I always find funny that I've known him that long. Uh, but but it, it's always cool to see when people believe in a product so much yeah. that they that they go and work for it. Yeah, no, it's really amazing. It's actually funny that you say that because like we were just starting out in the U.S. when I was a client. So the, the business was relatively new because we're headquartered in actually Luxembourg. And Christophe Fulchette, who's the founder, I remember him selling to me. And, <laughs> and I was like, he's passionate. I love it. I'm like, we're going to bring this product in. And, you know, the rest is kind of history. And then I was like, OK, I'll, I'll come to your side and him and you know, Todd Grossman, the uh, CEO of America has really made an impact. I'm like, how can I not be part of this? And mm -hmm. ever since then, it's like, I love uncovering social insights and helping customers and helping you know, change a company. So it really doesn't feel like work. And you know, people make fun of me for that, but I just love, love what we're able to do. Now, yeah, when you can no. map those things out, that's, that's, that's the best, right? Like when yeah. work doesn't feel like work because it's, I know. but, but, it, it can be all consuming. Yeah, I don't know about I know. you guys, especially during this time. There's no off switch. Oh my god! Yeah, I know. Ah, don't even get me started. That'll be another twenty minutes on how what I don't know how time? to put the computer can down. What is time? Can someone answer me this? What is time? <laughs> what day what is, day is it? Is it? <laughs> I'm like pulling these daily and and weekly incidents. I'm like, what? what? Where am I? What time? I don't know. Well, hopefully your product is helping you figure out what day it is because it at least you tells know, you the days. I do like a nice time stamp. It's really helping my entry and end point for the nice. day. So yeah. I'm really <laughs> grateful for that. So actually, you know what? I think a great place to start, Kara, because this, we're going to do something a little different, guys, today. We're actually going to let Kara share her screen if you're okay with that. 
um, Kara, with yeah. uh, with a deck just to go through the findings and we can talk yeah. through them. I want to be very discussion-based, discussion, discussion based, um, talk about some of the findings that you guys have been finding. But I think let's start just by explaining what TalkWalker is and does so that people have yeah. a, a background on how you guys get your information. Because it's all great to show insights, but if people people are always <laughs> A, skeptical about data, especially in this day and age, and then also um, being able to understand the way that you guys are getting your data, then they people can feel a little more understanding of you know where this is coming from or what how it originates and yeah, yeah, yeah. why it's worth trusting. Absolutely, I think as a researcher at heart, I think it's so important to understand methodology and what view you're looking at for the data. As you guys all know, as digital storytellers, data can tell any story that you want it to. So it's really important to have that methodology and understanding of where we're coming from when, when we're presenting this information. So a little background on TalkLooker, give you the, the quick uh, story as I flip my hand in my face. Sorry, I'm very animated with my hands. Um, but TalkLooker is a listening and analytics company. And what we are really leaders in is what we call conversational intelligence. And so it's taking mass amounts of conversations at scale across all various different media. So online news, blogs, forums, social networks, in addition to um, uh, customers have the ability to upload uh, data, customer data, such as uh, call center emails, and we're not just doing text analysis, but we're doing image and video as well. And so it really gives you that full picture of what are people saying about your brand? What are they saying about your competitors? And then taking it a next step up and really looking at what are the category and industry insights and those different audience groups that you can all leverage in your digital or uh, digital marketing strategies or for the purposes of this conversation, even your SEO what better way to surface and program your, your searches and, and um, those aspects by understanding how people are communicating. Um, so that's just a, you know, a little bit of what kind of data that we're, we're collecting from. So it's very- How do you guys do the video part? That seems like, I didn't realize that the video was there. Like you guys, yeah. actually, you guys are actually listening to the videos, transcribing them or using some kind of transcription to collect that so, information and, and understand it? Yeah. Yeah, so so the way we're, we're, we're doing a lot of data processing, it's by two ways. Text, right, which is more keywords. So think of those as a series of search words or conversation phrases that you build on the back end. So like you could say Coca-Cola and Pepsi or Coca-Cola and Fanta, not Pepsi, they probably want to look at that, or and not Pepsi. So you can combine various different keywords associated with another. That's how we're pulling the text analysis. How we're pulling image recognition is actually based on neural networks and finding relevant patterns and pulling in different objects or scenes or more traditionally logos. And we're applying that same rigor and best practices to do video analysis. Now, video analysis can only be done on Instagram and Twitter, mm -hmm. but the rest of image recognition can be across our entire database to get that complete. Interesting. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just I, I, yeah. I, I, that was just an immediate like I'm, I'm thinking if I'm thinking it, probably everyone else is wondering like, what are they no, doing? No, please ask. We're gonna the be question. a little geeky here, and you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the audience too, even though they're, they're a shy group. Uh, they're more like they're a bunch <laughs> well, of mar I marketing you voyeurs. All to interrupt me. Please interrupt me. Ask me questions. Ask me if I'm not explaining things right. Like that's what today's conversation intelligence live. Awesome. <laughs> I'll listen. So, I'll adapt. We'll, we'll go from there. I'll let um, you. So, I'll let you share your screen if you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure. I'm gonna make sure the tech is right. Can you just go ahead and share, and we'll see if it works. I'll let you know when we're seeing it. We are seeing it. We're good. Now, are you seeing your faces at all? Did I need to minimize that? No, no, no. Uh, we're just waiting for it to load. Okay, you're good. You're okay, on uh, the weekly insights. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so so as you guys know that I, I just kind of illustrated how, um, you know, we're pulling this information across text, um, text and visual and images, obviously there's not many images how we're pulling in COVID, there's no logo or anything like that. So it's really driven by a series of Boolean search queries. And what we wanted to pull in was just a series of, of different variations of how people are communicating about 
COVID-19, so that includes coronavirus, COVID, just general, and some other different items that we determined are relevant to be pulled in. And what we do is uh, we provide these daily insights and weekly insights to understand how the conversation is evolving over time. And what you're looking at is just a quick seven day snapshot. So overall, I think what's really interesting here, I think uh, you know, we wanted to make note of is COVID con um, conversations have actually tapered off this week. I don't know if you guys are able to see all these uh, built in platform uh, benchmarks that are put uh, automatically um, enabled in the talk worker platform. So what you're looking at is a 25% decrease comparatively to last seven day period. But as you can see, it, it's really, you know, still very high amounts of volume for seven day period. That's 90 million points of conversation. That's so, you know, the amount of data that you can understand is processed here is quite significant. All of that, 85.1 of those conversations are driven from social and around 4.8 are driven um, from, from online news. So online news, um, more news sites that are more factual in conversation. And what this tells us that it's not too surprising that conversation has you know, declined, but I think people are starting to talk about COVID-19 differently. Um, they have in the course, and I don't want to say this loosely, but I think there's this this idea of a new normal, and so it's not about you know just overall people talking about COVID. It's about what are the different behaviors that are associated to it, how are brands adapting, and we can see the different ebbs and flow of the conversations over time. It's funny you say that. I, it's, I kind of like to think of it. I was just talking to someone earlier about this, and I know this is like I don't want to. I don't want to muddy this up too much but yeah it kind of feels like um it kind of feels like stages of grief yes like we're going through the acceptance phase now yeah you know like we're, we're we were angry and like i think there's only so long you can be angry about something especially when it's out of your control and there's no one quote unquote to blame so it's yeah. like you have to move to this phase of acceptance and maybe acceptance also is this idea of like all right enough of the topic but I guess uh, I'll, I'll challenge you with this one. Do we know the difference in this uh, data between COVID-19 and coronavirus? Because it's funny, at the beginning of this, literally, I think it's our first episode, Pat says, like, how come people are using coronavirus versus not using COVID-19? Now I'm finding everyone is using COVID-19, yeah. but originally everyone was calling it coronavirus. Would that yeah. change the way you guys are interpreting this data? Is it like specific to the exact keyword? Or are you clustering things in a way that would have captured COVID-19 is coronavirus? Corona, uh, co the way we programmed this to be inclusive and comprehensive is corona and COVID are, you know, aggregating together. Synonyms, all okay, got it. Very variations of that. Now we we have broken that out. That was more of like our early analysis because it was an interesting transition, but now it's so interchangeable. We're really trying to look at the the impact of what that has um, had on the industry, but that's how we're pulling together those different search queries on the back end to, to yield this data. Cool, thanks. Yeah, of course. I think those are the really valid questions. So again, like people are still talking about COVID. Yeah, it's going, we're gonna see it continue to decline. I see that consistently. This is the second week in a row that it has declined over 20% in terms of conversation, but we're still talking in the millions. So to say it's not relevant statistically is just absurd. It's just evolving the way we're communicating about it, which and I think you hit the nail on the head with grief. I don't know if you actually read that New York Times article that came out and basically posed the question, what are we all feeling right now? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it was diving into we are in grief. And like that article generated a significant amount of engagement on social and virality because people really related to that emotion. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, mean, I think you would, it would be interesting to see, you know, just the... Uh, like the sentiment, you know, around the surge, because at the beginning, of course, it's doom and gloom, terror, yeah. uh, you know, as, you know, news is, news is still not good. Obviously, I just want to caveat this, that I, I do not believe the news is good, but yeah. heading in a more positive direction, it, yeah. you know, it would be interesting to see, like, you know, people's searches, you know, start to 10, you know, here in, you know, because here in New York, as you know, you know, they're talking about, like, 
you know, plans to reopen the economy? Like what, what would yeah. that look like? And I would, I would imagine that people, you know, would start to search for things that are a little bit more positive in nature. Uh, you know, hearing news like that, like, Hey, you know I mean? We're all looking here, like waiting, you know, to see what the light at the end of the tunnel is. And that's like the first little glint of light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, of course, you hope it's not a bear holding a lantern, but at the end of the day, it's one of those things where I wouldn't be surprised to see like those, like COVID-19 like COVID coronavirus, I, you know, that, those types of terms are going to be, you know, will persist, right? They will persist, but the sentiment around them are, you know, will, will change at, to a little bit more positive, hopefully, um, you know, to, yeah. as people start to think about life getting back to normal sometime in the near future, hopefully. Yeah, and, and overall, uh, you know, we, if we did this analysis across different regions and it's still quite negative. We have um, this net sentiment score that is out of negative 100 to a positive 100, just to give a simple benchmark. Mm -hmm. And across JPAC, Latin America, US and Europe, it's all significantly negative. I would say, depending on where you are in your, the journey of this, uh, is indicative of the sentiment around it, like JPAC was, like slightly less negative than um, it went, uh, JPEG was the most positive, then it went Europe, then US, and then Leta, which mm. I think kind of speaks to the evolution of the virus and the different stages of it, yeah. um, which is really interesting. Um, you know, other things that I think is interesting, we always say it's about conversations and context because we want to understand not only what people are saying, where they're saying it and why, and bringing in other different data sources to make sense of it and understand it to draw deeper conclusions. Because uh, Stavon, I think this is something we spoke about, you know, social search, it's all one view uh, of your consumers or, um, and your customers in that regards. And it's about what other data sets can you bring in to help understand a bigger picture. So what you're looking at here is we actually uploaded the number of uh, regional country cases that have been reported over time and correlating that to social conversations. And what I think is really interesting here is, you know, no matter what region, you're seeing a drop in that conversations on social and a rise in cases. And this it perfectly, Patrick, goes to your point of like the conversation shifting to be less specific COVID coronavirus conversations to be like, what is this new normal? What does this look like for me? What can I focus on instead of the virus? Is it cooking a new recipe? Is it baking bread? Is it watching a television show? Um, so like these are direct correlations of how it's shifting slowly. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because people are, I mean, as with anything, right, you know, no matter what the subject is, you know, there, there will be fatigue around it. You know, people yes. are, people are, don't want to be bummed out all the time, you know, and, you know, Corona, this, this whole thing's a bummer. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where people will, and you can see it, you know, like, as you said, you were doing the analysis, you can see people starting to think about, talk about, you know, life after this, this particular snapshot in time. And I think it's interesting just to see, like, because you can, you can do it right here, like, when was that, you know, when was that inflection point? When, when, yeah. when it, was it a big announcement from the president? Was it an announcement from, you know, you know, by governor, state by state, as they start to talk about, you know, hey, we're going to start going outside again. You know, you can actually yeah. go out and give someone a high five, uh, you know, yeah. things like that. You know, Never like, no high fives yet. For life. <laughs> no high fives yet, bro. We're, we're not in the high five world we again. got our elbow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's but, the new uh, COVID way, the yeah. new normal. Yeah, it's it's uh, you know I think I think fear has given way to uh, fear has given way to uh, um, uh, to not avoidance but like uh, not even acceptance but more uh, uh, just some form of a new normalcy and yeah we're gonna move to another phase of new normalcy I mean Rand Fishkin talked about this on the show on Friday but um, for now um, I think we're we're just like the new normal is you stay at home. You don't know how long it is. You deal with it. You don't worry for your life most of the time, hopefully. Mm. You, um, you hopefully don't spend all of your time worrying about your elderly or yeah. immunocompromised family. Mm -hmm. You stay in touch with them more than you probably ever have because you understand that now is like 
just that time. It, you, you need yeah. that, but you're coming into a routine. And I think people getting into a routine, even if the routine is different than what it used to be a month ago, it creates this sense of, okay, now there's something else to talk about. Yep. Like, yeah. I can't just keep talking about COVID and, and, and the things we probably care about, we probably to a degree understand, like, do you think people are still searching as much the conspiracy theories around this stuff or uh, the causes or, you know, the symptoms? Mm -hmm. I, I would assume by now, if you have not been, if you've been paying any form of attention, you've been bombarded with enough advertisements on TV, PSAs, all the messaging to understand these topics to a degree that you're not going to search for them anymore as much. And you're probably not going to, um, you're probably not going to go back and forth on, on, uh, with the exception of probably politics, because that seems to never stop. That is the constant in all of this. But to your point, like from a search perspective and from a social listening perspective, we've seen decline in conversations across the board. We looked at uh, the symptoms around lack of taste, coughing, um, fever, and, and those have been steadily on the decline of people talking about those, yeah. uh, you know, since the beginning of this. And, and what we are seeing a rise in is more of those consumer interest behaviors, people baking the bread. How many people have seen their friends post their pictures of the bread? What of is cooking that? Their what? Why bread? Why bread? Like, I bread is a thing. Loving cooking bread have you not seen this no i have seen it and i've seen it too much it's passover like i'm going crazy over here all i got is matzah and you guys are all on there showing me bread it's Sorry. like well it's stefan stefan it was a collective force against you that's oh why we, yeah that's this is all about me it. of course the it is timing of this was the conspiracy theory in action <laughs> yeah i'm like the day i choose to go on a religious atkins <laughs> i mean that, that's why we didn't invite you to breads of conductor slack channel you know? oh i didn't know there was a breads of conductor slack channel damn it kara's probably already been invited um i have it's been great we've been sharing all the different types of bread i mean we, someone has made a nice sesame seed a multi-grain a cinnamon toast you're really missing out oh my wife when we were watching a cooking show last night and she's like i think i have all the ingredients to make banana bread and then she's like oh shit it's still passover isn't it and i'm like yeah, you're going to have to wait. Mm -hmm. Your wife is on trend. Brand banana bread is trending up. Are you serious? Yes. Get it's out of here. Bread, don't don't, bread. don't just it's say what I want to hear, Kara. This is not what this is about. I'm going to text is. Steph right now and tell her to make that bread. <laughs> it's literally, it literally, banana bread is the new bread. It's like the, the new pivot from making your sourdough breads. It's literally been the, the data trending point. That's been the shift, biggest shift. And so I'm seeing into next week, we did this again, an even higher amount of conversations around banana bread and the steady decline of sourdough because it's not as trendy anymore. Wow. Interesting. Kara, have you, have you done any analysis around the Tiger King documentary? <laughs> uh, why, yes, we have. <laughs> um, you know, I think the, you know, that uh, we we did a whole analysis on consumer behaviors and one of them was around what are people doing and obviously what comes up highest is t watching television yeah. you know, when you go into that you're like well, what's behind that television so then we segmented by Netflix HBO um, and news and of course news actually comes in you know the top which I was very pleased to see consumers really looking That's good. Things, <laughs> consuming so like there is hope for me there then That's second good. to that is Netflix and Tiger King just was like <laughs> blowing up um, yeah. in terms of overall conversations. And yeah. what I found even more interesting about that is I think that they planted a tiger at the Bronx Zoo. Yeah, that was weird. If everyone did not get that memo, like a tiger at the Bronx Zoo got COVID. And that was like mind boggling because I'm like, mind -boggling. Uh, of all the animals, it wasn't like a baboon, it wasn't a gorilla, it was a tiger during the Tiger King you know, saga. Which is just like, okay, that just seems way too coincidental. That's divine intervention right there. Or, or a little more, I don't know. I heard they put out another episode last night and I heard it was meh, meh. Um, uh, so anyway. Yeah, the, it, it's very interesting. I, I think it's, you know, the, what people are turning to, you know, they're just looking for a sense of community and like they're trying to find it on social. I think 
Um, we can even say that around social channels coming up, up and coming, like TikTok, the emergence of that, like what would TikTok have done without, you know, the coronavirus? I think it's been a, a huge opportunity for it to grow its longevity as, as a social platform that, you know, uh, people were actually able to pull a TikTok logo and then also people are dual um, hosting. And so we're seeing a significant uh, uptick in, in TikTok and also Twitter again, re re-emerging. Interesting. Twitter probably, I would assume, because of its like, Not its news. duality in the news, yep. right? And then, but TikTok, interesting. So that's a, we got to let, uh, we got to let Dwayne Forrester know this one, Pat, because he's been, uh, he's been preaching, preaching from the, from the rooftops for at least a good, I mean, in our 2020, uh, like forecast for things to look at, uh, in December, he was calling TikTok as like the undervalued yeah. channel that people should get into and understand and so forth. And then I guess fuel to the fire in this case, TikTok takes off, uh, maybe due to just the idle nature of our society and our, our kids right now. But man, that was uh that's, that, that was, that would be a good bet if you'd put money on TikTok right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just the amount of, I think, um, not even just younger generation, older gener, like, uh, you know, baby boomer, like everyone's going on it and doing these videos, these dancing, like that's their form of community to like do these elaborate chore uh, choreographed dances with their families, <laughs> which is really special. <laughs> I'm still waiting for Pat's TikTok. I haven't seen it yet. You know, okay. I hope as a follow-up to this that we all create a choreographed dance. Oh, yes, TikTok. yes. I will I will take the data and do an interpretive dance to the data. Yes. Um, mine, data. Mine's just going to be dance. me staring blankly watching Stefan doing his dance. Yeah, I've, but, I've got, I've got a video. Isn't that part of the magic of TikTok? <laughs> I think I've got a video. I've got a video, and I wish I could share it on here. It's from back at WeWork summer camp where we were all wet and cold in a tent after oh, no. a after a seven hour flight yep. and uh and pat that was Rein a day pat, was a day. pat reinhardt's expression is, that was an experience uh, is is probably one of the mo most uh most most uh For specific context, on context, point i i am not a camping person uh but okay. uh, you know but we had it was me stefan uh uh, uh baruch and uh, who's on the call right now and uh and Howie, Howie, who uh, you, you know, and we all shared a yurt together. It was it was a special. Oh my few days. gosh! Yeah, it was a special. Oh. Few days. But Pat's face in that video is is pretty much what I would expect from his uh, his version of an interpretive dance to uh, the data. So, but I think <laughs> well, we've gone far enough down that rabbit hole. Here. Yeah, <laughs> we've gone okay. far enough down that rabbit hole. So, what are we what are we looking at here? Yeah, yeah what is this? this is back to the data. So again, you know, a couple of insights here, and then hopefully I'll show you something interesting because I think it's, you know, important and powerful to look at data. And what we try to do is we look at it by industry to understand the different nuances and how it's being discussed. And again, we're just looking at, at you know, a short seven day period. But as you can see, um, overall, the conversation has gone down in volume and sheer volume alone across FinServe, CPG, retail, and pharma. I would say FinServe industry conversations are really centered around more conversations around insurance, particularly. Really? Um, you know, there's travel insurance that they're dealing with all these different claims and delays, and then you've got health insurance that's factored in there, which you know, is a whole another area uh, that you know is really bubbling up in conversations and consumer concerns, and then um, additionally unemployment. Uh, so people are not only just looking for claim information, how to access this information and how we can make things more affordable, you know, for people who don't never necessarily have access. And I think there's a lot of uh, interesting leaders coming out in this forefront. Uh, and I'll dive into these more in, in detail from leveraging one of our, our uh, visualizations, which I think is pretty cool. But overall, I think the only industry that's really kind of, we see a little peak in conversation is really the pharma industry. You know, how they can continue to get medical, um, you know, short as a, there's a short as a medical supplies, there's a race for a vaccine that, you know, we really want people to donate to and help. And so there's, there's a tremendous opportunity for the pharma industry to kind of navigate through this. Um, you know, they're definitely uh, affected by 
uh, all of this, and this kind of gives you a quick input. So now I'm going to show you each of the um, these different uh, industries and kind of talk about what's changed pre-COVID and I say post, but we're really living during it. I'm optimistic here, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but like looking at the financial service industry, and I this is our conversation cluster. So again, centered around the fastest way to uncover insights without being an analyst in what we call, this is augmented analytics. Um, so you can surface insights looking at mass amounts of, of data sets and contextualizing it and making sense of it. And at the center of it is the most discussed and it's all interconnected and you can see how closely um, it's understanding these contexts and surfacing insights. So before coronavirus really kind of took off, it was really centered around more Trump impeachment, which we haven't heard in a while. It was around inter interest rates, economic policies, and a lot more, you know, around climate change and things like that. And now, since coronavirus has really taken off, it's really about essential and non-essential services. It's about national debt. It's about um, you know, really homeschooling and, and thinking about things more from a recession perspective and how we can help the economy. So I think it's really important to, again, how can you talk to consumers and be relatable to them? The, the, the messages and your tactics and approaches during a, a crisis or a pandemic like this do not change. You still need to understand how consumers are talking and how you can be authentic with your brand and speak with them and not at them. And having the, the way that understanding of what they care about and what's driving them in their discussions is really instrumental here, whether you're you know, building out your search um, or whether you're just trying to inform and shape your strategy and develop a whole campaign um, you know, serviced around uh, helping uncover insights. Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting. <laughs> like understanding oh, the problems. Understanding the problems is fundamental right now to coming yeah. up with the solutions. I'm very surprised. So I don't know if anyone's watching traditional TV. I know I have to date myself now to be like, I actually watch yeah. cable. Um, <laughs> but like, I, I, I watch actual cable. And, and part of the reason I like to do that is I want to consume commercials. And yeah. uh, I want to consume commercials as a marketer. I want to see what people are actually saying. It's interesting to me, the auto companies, man, they're the only ones that are really not taking their foot pun intended off the gas and just saying yeah. like, we'll change the message. We'll actually even give you value proposition and say, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll give you leases for this much time or we'll mm -hmm. forgive you on your need to pay, or they'll actually come back with a value proposition and a message and go straight to it where others are like trying to piece together messaging. It's not really clear what they're doing. Yeah. They're kind of like, we're here for you, but we don't really know what to tell you our solution is. Um, and a lot have just disappeared. They're just not even in the conversation yeah. anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's just surprising to me in a time when it, I'm assuming airtime is probably cheaper than it's ever yeah. been to buy. Um, how are you not taking the problems that you're seeing in data like this recognizing them and then going and solving it with a, yeah. with a solution and then putting that solution out in an empathetic way, right? Not a capitalistic, I'm going to take your money way, but like there's, there's really great ways to say we're here for you and explain how you're there for them. People yeah. spend so much on branding otherwise, and yet yeah. they're choosing not to brand in a time when their brand matters more than ever. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more. And, and I think this is really showing yeah, there's a line in the sand of companies doing this well and companies not doing this well and that are adjusting their strategy to the time and like whether it's forging new partnerships together. Like I'm still like, I love the new Google Apple partnership together and I, I'll show the nice visualization of that later on. But, you know, how can you take technology and merge it together to be helpful in this time? And I like that you can put away like, you know, competitor standpoint. And I think it kind of goes to that community as well. And like my favorite ad to this day is the Nike ad that they came out with that it just holds true to the brand where here's a, a thing that they did that's not really adjusting their strategy, but I, wow, the message really resonated with you. And I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's around that uh, one, we're all one team, one community. Mm -hmm. It came out a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you guys saw that. Yeah, no, um, it's, a, it's a tremendous ad. But like, how how much did that like 
there's no added value there. There's no, you know, nothing that they're trying to sell. It's just like, let's band together. We can all do our part and, you know, spread awareness, stay at home. You know, there are worse things in this world than, than having to stay quarantined. Right. Right. So I thought that was pretty powerful. Uh, then just showing like a, a CPG focus. Uh, so I thought this was interesting that most CPG companies were actually talking about more unhealthy eating trends and different apps that they could leverage. And now, you know, during COVID, it's about panic buying and supermarkets and things like that. So I think that's really interesting and in what to do during quarantine and different restaurant tactics. So interesting shifts. Again, how can you kind of adjust your messaging, adjust the concern and help customers speak to what they're interested in. They're not as concerned of like what's healthy and not healthy anymore. Case point bread trend. And then I, I don't want to, I have, there's so many here and I, I, I don't want to derail it too much if we want to segue out of here, but just looking at how the pharma industry really shifted from being more about different research around diseases like cancer and Parkinson's and more prescription drug fails and things like that. And now shifted to really banding together to that community with base max and things like that. And then, and then the final one I'll talk to is more on the retail industry, which I think is really interesting. And there's a lot of companies doing this really well is the shift from, you know, these more brick and mortar focus on economic growth and creating experience and, you know, just, um, you know, baby Yoda and creating toys, but now how can these retail businesses shift? And some of the client uh, customers out there are doing it well, um, you know, from a retail perspective, they're looking at, you know, how can they incorporate live tutorials? Like I think the beauty industry is really doing this well. They, it could be a time where people aren't buying makeup or feeling kind of like, why bother? I'm at home. I mean, I, yeah. yeah. Change it out of my sweatpants for for this this video. <laughs> Actually, I lied. I'm sweatpants on the bottom, business on top. But... <laughs> don't worry, we don't make anyone stand in, in, in during the sessions <laughs> for fear. For fear, good, good, yeah, good. I'm I'm glad we're 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 staying. With my cover isn't blown completely yet, but the the beauty industry is really evolving, and companies like Glossy have launched a live editor con. Uh, you know, platform where they can interact with the consumers. They can talk to one another. Uh, other beauty companies are creating more YouTube videos or different chat sessions where you can go do tutorials. They're engaging with influencers. You know, now during this time when you're kind of stuck inside, maybe you want to do a little self-care. And, and I think the beauty industry is really evolving and thinking about digital. And I, I think we're going to see surprisingly you know, ones that are more direct to consumer, digital focused, not be as impacted. Like yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. And it, it's interesting you say that because um, one of the one of the, the folks who works for us over at Conductor, his wife is a hairstylist and she runs her own small studio. Uh, so, yep. so, you know, the last few days, she actually has been asking on Facebook, hey, what, like, if I were to do tutorial videos, because a lot of people, have, you know, like, what would you want me to start with? And she had yeah. this slew of people answer, you know, just like, hey, listen, I don't know how to do this. I'm, you know, like, or, you know, should I, you know, like, don't, you know, how to cut your own hair or how to dye your own hair, things like that. So you see, you see it, the transfer from social to ultimately creating content that can be found in, you know, can be found in traditional search. Uh, so that resonates with me highly, you know, from the, the fashion and uh, the beauty industry, excuse me, is that people are starting to think about that. It's not just big companies doing that. And we, we've talked about this before, Stefan, that a lot of a lot of businesses or, you know, independent folks like yoga instructors, kickboxing instructors, yes. karate instructors, they're all offering free online classes right now. But ultimately, that will turn into a new business for them. Uh, when you think about it, it's like, hey, listen, you could you could teach someone yoga anywhere in the world, it, you know, as long as the times match up. You know, it doesn't matter that they're not sitting in the studio with you. I mean, look at Peloton, right? Their whole business yes. is based is based on you know people streaming you know classes that happened days, if not weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, I am one of those people. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, so it's one of those things where I think we're going to see a, a shift towards that, but. 
the beauty industry, like what you're showing here, makes total sense to me because you know to do you know how to videos. That's something that everyone is talking about right now. Like I don't know, like I'm gonna have to cut my hair at some point. I will. I will actually talk to your. I'm gonna text your wife, yeah. Vanessa, and we're gonna see if we can have that done. I think that might be the highest attended uh, search from home show. If we just I, 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 I'm ready to watch that one. When, when, when's that one coming on? I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have to work with Vanessa on it. But if we can, if we can have that live on the show, Pat, that would be mm. a, a huge uh, ratings boost for us. Yeah. <laughs> in, yeah, in, yeah. Another question for me is, uh, you know, this blonde hair isn't necessarily real. So, like, if she can give some tutorials on that, too. I'm <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. Um, it's funny because uh, I think the CEO of um, the CEO of Walmart said we're in our uh, hair dyeing phase of the yes. coronavirus, right? <laughs> We've gotten to that point where everyone kind of starts having to need to do that. So um, it's it's really interesting too. Um, I'll take this to just a retail perspective that I think uh, just hit me while we were we were talking. So yeah. I don't know if you guys heard, Amazon is now considering allowing third party vendors to come back on and sell non-essential items. So it's almost like they're reopening, right? Their version yeah. of reopening the economy for them <laughs> is not allowing the supply chain to be filled up with other stuff. It's making sure that they're only delivering stuff that was essential, which means everything that was prime that usually came in yeah. two days was getting delayed, which we've talked about before. What's yeah. interesting here is, do we think Amazon's doing that because if they stayed out of the game for long enough, the dependency others have on them as a reseller would reduce. That companies like makeup companies and others that are so used to third party being, third party selling being their mm -hmm. potentially lion's share of some of their business. I know some yeah. businesses that only do 1% through their own website, right? And everything else and major companies and everything else is done through resellers. The dependency on resellers, much like our dependency, let's say on ventilators being made elsewhere, um, might be problematic to their business's future. And recognizing that problem, this has brought it to their attention, this economically has. And now with long enough of Amazon not playing the role Amazon normally does in their business, perhaps Amazon's a little worried that they might actually lose some of that share to direct to consumer. I, well, that's a that's a hard question. I think it also, uh, you know, Amazon has a monopoly. That's clear. Uh, you know, I think for for better or for worse, you know, they've entrenched themselves in society and they've made it an active workflow and an active part of all of us to go there. But you know, I know it does monopolize, but at the same time, it gives you access to smaller businesses that maybe depend on some of that. Sure. So I'll, I'll kind of, you know, play devil's advocate here just for the purpose of this, but, or is it because small businesses are really hurting and they need the Amazon revenue? Sure. And I'm not knocking Amazon per se. I'm saying like, I'm saying it's just very interesting to think that much like a small gym now thinks about doing yeah. things digitally. Well, I think big companies are now going to have to think how much of my business flows through somebody else. Yeah. And how much of it ha do I need to become self-dependent? You yeah. know, it's almost like that. I, I hate being um, like historic in this way, but the isolationism that like certain yeah. countries thought they needed to take on back in the day, feudal Japan would be an example of that. And um, yeah, I just brought marketing to feudal Japan. Uh, but, yeah. but like that isolationism and saying we need to depend only on ourselves or to a degree much more on ourselves than we do on others. Because when something like this happens, that's out of our control, our business swings and we have even less control over those swings, right? Yeah. So maybe, maybe um, some of that reopening is happening because there's a concern from Amazon. I would hope that, to your point, Kara, that it's done because of <laughs> altruism. <laughs> Altru Good for your altruism. I, being the ever-present pessimist on this call, um, <laughs> they call it realism, damn it. Um, uh, I, I believe I, I believe there might be a little bit of self-interest there on behalf of Amazon. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure there's some self-interest. Sure. Bezos, Bezos cares about the bottom line. It's, yeah. Uh... Anyway, let's move on. So there's some other stuff you wanted to show us, and I know we have a uh, we have. Yeah. Uh, I, and I don't need to get through all of this. I no, think, no, uh, but just point out some of the stuff that you think is like. Yeah, I think uh -huh. again, there, there. I already talked about the Apple and Google teaming up, so I don't think I need to go here, but this is just a way 
how we measure the impact of the partnership. And as you can see, things start on Twitter and then spread to different facets of different media sites. So online news, blogs, forums, et cetera. And you can kind of see who are your amplifiers and how they're communicating across the process. And then here's the fun part that I'll, I'll kind of dive into. This is what we've been talking about is understanding consumer behaviors and interests. And I told you social media and television are at the top. Uh, really, you know, driving a lot of these conversations and social media, again, it's Twitter, it's TikTok, and then that television I've kind of already talked to. And then I know you're always disappointed in this one, Stevan, the cooking with the yeah. baking and there. <laughs> but again, people, it's still in the decline a little uh, comparatively to the previous period, but still worth noting. And then what I think is, is really interesting, and this kind of plays into how brands are adapting, is looking at the in-home activities and exercising and using Zoom, giving Zoom an opportunity, giving Slack an opportunity to evolve their product based on these different insights. So like Slack, you know, probably wouldn't have seen such an emergence without something like COVID and then added, you know, a whole video feature. So like, how can you take, you know, this situation and adapt to it? Patrick, to your point about exercising and yoga, how can you, you know, take those and turn them into subscription services. It's like looking at these insights, these moments, like even apps like House Party, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that you can leverage to create more of a community than just text and social. Like let's get people looking at each other, engaging. Let's go back to the basics and not hide behind, you know, a screen literally with words. Let's look at each other. Let's have a conversation. And I think that that's a really cool moment for us to watch this true digital transformation. And Savannah, I think we were talking about this, of how there's a, a meme that was trending on social that we were picking up. And it said, what led the digital transformation at your company? And it was like your CEO, CEO your COO, and then COVID-19. And that was certainly really bad. It's I funny, Kara. I thought, I thought of you. I saw another one. That you said, saw another one? I saw another one I got to send to you. No, no, I, I, I it literally crossed my LinkedIn feed and uh, I'm crazy. I'm like on at like two in the morning when I should be sleeping and, and yeah, me too. I, I should have grabbed it. And you're on the West Coast, so it wouldn't have been weird sending it to you. But um, there was a picture of people in a boardroom on one side and they're all sitting there going like, we don't need digital transformation and it had a wall. And then it had this huge wrecking ball that looked like it was going to hit the wall that said COVID-19 <laughs> on it. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly that's what it is. Yeah. That's I mean, it. I think it's also interesting that the second, you know, and to your point, Carrie, the second largest thing here is parties and get togethers, right? People want to see other people, you know, and we were talking about before, like families are probably talking to other family members more than they previously did. I know personally, that I have spoken to my sister more in the last two months than I typically do in an entire year just because she doesn't live near me, uh, you know? And we, we text every once in a while, but actually physically seeing her, my nephew, my brother-in-law, I've seen those three more in the last couple of months than I have, like I said, in the, in the, in the previous 12, most likely. Yeah, it's so it's, you know, it, 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 it's starting to like, it's nice, you know? It's starting to kind of get people thinking that way, but people do want, to hang out, you know, people like house party, you just mentioned, like me and my friends use house party two or three times a week just to hang out uh, and not just stare at each other on the Zoom. You know, there's an activity involved. Uh, where yeah, normally, games. yeah, I mean, normally I'd be out on my buddy Pat's backyard, you know, chipping golf balls and drinking beer. <laughs> Can't do that right now, you know, so yeah, people yeah. are looking for ways to replace that. It'd be interesting yeah. to look at this data by, um, can you look at this data by, uh, is there any way to break it down by like uh, age or demographic in that oh, way? So many different ways. Okay, because like I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering this, right? So like I'm thinking about people I know that are single and they're, uh, they're potentially alone, right? In their homes. Yeah. It is literally the only medium in which you will socialize. Yeah. Like I can, I can get away with being at home happy with my wife and then you guys are all my friends or at least i've said this before i, I hope you'll all be my friends um I, I live a sad life um but but i don't need like to use i use video with family and friends but probably not as much as people i know who are alone right because yeah. that loneliness like going through this process completely alone and if you are i'm sorry on the on the, yeah. on the call 
on the video because I can imagine that's very isolating and very yeah. difficult, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is your only form. I mean, aside from like going to a window and cheering at 7 p.m. for first responders or yelling across uh, the street to your neighbor or like, you know, making a phone call, this is literally video is the only way you're going to physically interact yeah. with someone right now. Yeah. That's crazy. That's That's yeah. got to be a much higher grouping of certain groups, age groups, than other age groups, I'm assuming. Yeah. I would assume and definitely can can break that down. And I think that's a really interesting aspect. We break it down by different um, age groups and then also different uh, audience segmentations as well. Yeah, you see that would, to me, that would be like really interesting because think about someone like AARP, Pat. Mm -hmm. AARP should be right now creating um, content around Zoom. My parents, are definitely potentially AARP members. And if they aren't already, I haven't asked them about that. Yeah. But like, but like they definitely came to me and we've joked about this on the show before, like Zoom was like this new thing, but I've been using Zoom for business like for at least a year or more, right? So mm -hmm. they were like, oh, it's the new thing, right? So interesting, you pull up millennials and parents, here we go. The two groups that I, I feel like don't timing. know what the hell is going on. Yeah. Timing's so, everything. Timing's <laughs> everything. So tell us what they're talking about. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the different groups of different individuals and different ways to segment data can be very powerful. And I think um, when we look at different audience segments, we're not only just looking at people who've self-identified of age, because obviously there's all these restrictions with sure. Facebook and Instagram, and that's one way of doing it. But we think there's a lot of different proxy groups that you can build based on what people are saying, how they're posting it, and why. Um, leveraging our text and image recognition. So millennials, what we found, especially during this COVID price, are really concerned about the general well-being of everyone else. They're concerned about the hospital, the supplies, the public health, the emergency. Um, you know, that's like their biggest priority. And like working together, overcoming challenges, looking at the administration. While parents, and rightfully so, this, they have a whole, you know, different humans to, to care for and, and love and think about homeschooling and love for their family. How are they going to provide for their family? How are they going to provide their kids with education? How are they going to deal with the, the stress of being home all the time? Maybe not having the support that you normally do or you know, you know trying to be more involved to make sure that they have everything they're needed. And it's these two different groups of people that can be really important of how you again, communicate to them based on what's important to them, what they're searching for, what they care about, how they are dealing with this. I think the biggest thing and take home that I wish everyone would is that no person is the same and it's really important to understand how they're feeling and being relatable and having that authentic uh, message because as you're seeing all those ads, you know, you want something that's not artificial. You want something really real right now. I think people are really craving that. And just to give context, you're able to take this down to some keyword level data as well, right? It rolls up. We're looking at roll ups, but you can see more specific query data, right? You've rolled them up into thematics here. But so, we can so, actually correlate those back to keywords, right? Because the search people are going to go, okay, yeah. this is good. This is This is giving me topically where I need to go. How do I get down to go closer to what I would have looked at in a search perspective to pull that so, back? Actually, why I showed you this one to close with for the purpose of timing, the other ones are more topic insight level that we've aggregated and summarized and edited to clean. But this is actually the raw themes of keywords that you can leverage in your search. So these are all, all aggregated on commonly used keywords that are behind these audience groups. So I thought that was a really great place to show you guys the raw keyword driven analysis. So if you need to inform your keyword search strategy, a conversation cluster is a really great way to do that to understand how people are communicating and how these words are associated to one another because you don't think that they would be some of them. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, we're all getting real. Yeah, look, yeah, no, we're all leaning like, in. Like, I'm like, oh. Yeah, you guys are all like, I finally piqued your interest. I should have known not to summarize my, my no, keywords no, for with, search with, people, as as I wanted to show of, you the art of the possible. You brought me keywords? Are you crazy? That's like, yeah. uh, 
That's like, uh, I'm not even going to make a comment. You get lost in this for hours. I'll see you next week. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I like to close dramatically with giving the people what they want. (laughs) Give the people what they want. That's a good, that's a good slogan. I'm down with that. (laughs) I mean, there's definitely, listen, um, I think hopefully what this has done today um, to kind of bring this all with a bow. Hopefully what this has done today is show people that obviously there's a lot of data out there. We knew that, right? But the ability to cluster and categorize is done by other forms and other mechanisms. So uh, our partners right now in our companies, if they exist, if you're at a company large enough that has someone in charge of social, someone in charge of paid, someone in charge of internal search or any of those other aspects, if you're sitting in a real big company, they're probably separate people. If you're in a smaller company, you might be that Jack or Jill of all traits that has a lot of those aspects. You should be looking at as many data sets as possible to try and get an image of what the new normal or the new persona looks like. The persona is not the same. The persona has changed. The concerns, the problems, the needs are different. If you move forward with the assumption that everything is as it was before, you are equivalent to the same person who emailed me today and I actually wrote back on a cold email asking me if the reason I hadn't responded to them was because a whale had eaten me. Well, while that might have been funny in a post-COVID world, a pre-COVID world, now it just seems silly and out of touch. So um, same message, wrong room, as, <laughs> as uh, Rand Fishkin said, read the room. So the way to read the room is to understand the data. And if you can get your hands on more data, not to overwhelm yourself with it, but to try, because there is no right answer here. No one can tell you. No one has marketed in this kind of an environment before to know for a fact this is the way you're supposed to do it. Sure, there are crisis communication people and others that will tell you do this or don't do that. That's fine. There need to be some boundaries, right? But within those boundaries, recognizing how the data can be used and leveraged across multiple um, channels, now is the time to break the silos. Now is the time to look for the commonalities Now is the time to look for themes and then look for solutions, right? Look for the problem, look for the solution, put them together and market them. Teach your executives what's going on. I guarantee you 90% of your executives at your companies, no offense to them, do not have direct access and would never spend the time looking into the data the way you will. So taking this kind of data, taking our data, taking anyone's data, in fact, that you can get your hands on in your company to understand what's going on is going to make you more effective marketer in this very strange time. Um, That was the point of today. So hopefully you guys have all gotten uh, a lot out of that. I know I have. Kara, thank you so, so much for coming and sharing this data with us. Uh, I feel smarter because of it, and I'm definitely going to be digging around into more of it and uh, now I hate that we know each other well because I'm probably going to be bugging you about more data. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the line is always open and I'm always down for a video chat, but just know it's going to be business on top. You, know, so you, got on it. Bottom. you got it. You got it. That's not a problem. We always keep our cameras up here. Uh, anyway. <laughs> as we do say, as we, as we always, uh, as we always say. So uh, actually let's just give a, a quick heads up tomorrow. We have uh Doug Cirillo from A Place for Mom. He's going to be talking about uh, the impact. If you know what A Place for Mom is, uh, they are a connection to many of the nursing homes and and uh, and elderly care that goes on in the United States, and their connector between the consumer and those places. Um, interesting. He just took that job on recently. So what it's like to take on a new job in the middle of a pandemic, not to mention be in the middle of a weird crisis. Uh, while you have to market in a new mode. So that's going to be a very interesting conversation. He'll be on tomorrow at noon as usual. So thank you guys all for joining us. Really appreciate it. As we always say, stay home, stay safe, stay positive, and uh, stay with us for the next episode. Thanks so much. Thank you guys so much for having me. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kara. Bye.